Kanunga and the surrounding military training land in southeast Queensland has a long history of Yowie sightings by both public and military. Many military personnel have contacted the AYR over the years, stating they found themselves face to face with the Yowie during training exercises at Kanungra. The Kokoda Barracks is surrounded by 60 square kilometres of mountainous terrain with thick rainforests and deep valleys. It's off limits to the public, but evidently not to the Yowie. These are the big variety rivaling the size of the two buck caught on the thermal camera last year. On the boundary of the land is Beachmont Road and a small location called Withering. It was here at 5pm, March 10, 2015, when witness Rob was driving his delivery van down the range late at night. Standing in the darkness on the side of the road was a male yowie between 8 to 10 feet tall. He walked out in front of the van from right to left and then watched as he drove past. Here's a few words from Rob. I was driving down Beachmont Canungra Road. As I was coming down through the S-Bend, whatever it was just took two steps from the right side of the road straight across in front of me. It was huge. It was the body mass of it was like I'm a big guy. And this thing just, yeah, it was, it was massive. It was so thick from its chest to its back. Its head looked like it had been, sh- you know, shrunk down into its body like it was no neck. So I got a good look at this thing. I was sitting up in the truck. I was coming down the hill and its head was level with where I was sitting. It was friggin' massive. It towered over me, mate. I'd say probably anywhere from eight to 10. That big, yeah, it was huge. It was big. Rob is a champion bodybuilder. Yet he states, the muscle of this being dwarfed him. On November 13, 2019, at 10 minutes past 10 in the morning, after delivering a load of dirt up the mountain, Glenn Kilmartin came coasting down the mountain range around the mountain bends in his truck while in neutral. What happened next made world news. It was just after 10 o'clock in the morning. And I was coming down the hill empty in my truck. Started to come around the right hand, a sharp right hand corner, and I thought I saw a boulder rolling onto the road off this embankment. So I hit the brakes to stop from hitting this rock. It stood up, it was, wasn't a rock at all. I managed to skid to a halt just before it. This thing stood up, it was right in front of the bonnet. Had hair probably two inches long all over its body. Had a round face, a bit like a chimpanzee. Its eyes were dark. It was dark around the eyes and it had black eyes and its pupil or the center of the eyes was hazel colored. It had a flat nose, like it had been a boxer. And you could see its ears, it didn't have any hair on its ears either. Its head looked too small for its body. It seemed to be pushed forward. The hair was uh, really dark brown with a reddish tinge to it and matted and it was just big, it was huge. The top of the bonnet is six foot off the ground so its belly button was six foot high. I had to duck down so that I could see its face. It seemed to be shocked that I was there but it seemed to be a little bit embarrassed and that just turned to anger. Um, you could see anger in its face easy enough. And he punched the centre of my bonnet of my truck. Because of the height of him, it was sort of a downward push, but it was a like a don't argue in rugby, you know, where they just throw their hand out and push the defender away. And it's not a punch, it's just a push, like, get out of my way. Because he was so tall, he had to sort of reach down to do it a bit. The force was from the front of the truck to the back of the truck, if you know what I mean. It was almost as if I hit a small car or something. Just before he hit the truck, he um, grunted. It wasn't a scream or a cry or a howl or anything. It was just a... <clears throat> and hit the front of my truck. Glenn's account occurred only a few hundred metres away from Rob's sighting. The sketch Buck drew while sitting down with Glenn seems now to be the media's go-to image while reporting on Yowie sightings. 
On the 16th of June, one of our team, Shannon Guthrie, had his own close encounter, which was almost too close. Shannon was present alongside myself, Gary and Buck, the night of Buck's extraordinary footage at Springbrook. Together, we've sweated and bled day and night over the years in search of further evidence of the Yowie, navigating some of the most hostile terrain imaginable, sometimes with no result. Then at 4.15 in the morning last month, Shannon had a change of luck. Along the same stretch of road as the previous witnesses, Rob and Glenn, while riding his bike to work in the morning darkness, Shannon rounded a corner to find a juvenile Yowie squatting in the middle of the road. Just with Glenn's description of emotions, this performed a physical brace for impact, turning its head away and putting its hand up towards the bike in defence. Shannon suddenly corrected his riding line. Even then, there was light contact as he rode past, with the hand touching his leg. After all the days hiking and exploring the Gold Coast hinterland in search of more confirmations, this would be Shannon's first close quarters encounter. This would be Shannon's Steve Bradbury moment. It simply happened, just like any other normal day-to-day witness who's had a roadside sighting. Perhaps this one, though, was a little closer. It's here I'll hand you over to AYR's Sarah Bignall. As I say, welcome back to Witherin. Last Wednesday... That week I was um, starting early. I set off along the top of Beachmont. And this is where I come to a section called Farm Grove. So it's the end of Beachmont up the top and then it's the start of Witherin. As I'm dropping down, there's a, a right-hander, the slightly banked right-hander, and then there's this left tight-hand blind corner. Probably doing about 70 k's. I know the road well, so so I come up to the left, left-hand corner. With motorbikes, when you take a corner, you go from the outside in. So I've lined up the left-hand corner. So it's a tight one. So I've gone wide, and just as I've come around the middle, so coming around the blind, so I'm starting to see the straight in the middle of the road. Oh, this is hard. <laughs> um what I can best describe, like a five-year-old child covered in hair from head to toe in a black fur, black fuzz, squatted in the middle of the road with its head down. I've discussed with Dean and Gary and other members of the team possibilities of why he would have had his head down. It had its head down the whole time, like it was just looking at the ground. And it's like that other case we had like the spider pose but not as stretched out just squatted like it landed and was just looking on the ground just think of a five-year-old child covered in fur that's hit the gym one too many times that's exactly what it was so i'm coming around 70 k's it's a tight left he's there squatted noticed me at the last minute i've noticed him at the last minute but he's in my riding line i have to quickly adjust the best I can to avoid him. He's adjusted his line. Well, he stepped back a little bit, but he's always keeping his head down. He never looked at me. It was quite a terrifying experience. I'm just glad it wasn't dad or mum. When I adjusted my line, he's put one hand down on the ground, put his head completely back, not showing. And this is when I got to see there was little to no neck on him because his head was turned fully around and this is the kicker this is the kick of what i say to everyone he reached up and put his palm as to brace himself for impact there was one two three four fingers and a thumb now its hand for its size was bigger than mine by maybe an inch or two think Working lettery hands. I got a good look at his hand too because the light shone on its hand. Working lettery hands, and I seen pink pigmentation. It's like someone 
been working the whole life, calluses, but I've seen pink pigmentations. The skin colour, a lot darker than ours. I wouldn't say like a gorilla where it's solid black, just darker. But it had like pink pigmentation. I just, I remember it clearly. It seared in my mind, just the palm. When I corrected my line, he's turned away. He's put one hand on the ground, one hand up, the palm to brace himself. As I've gone past him, we've only had seconds to correct both ourselves. When he put his palm up, it had brushed my boot. Like when I mean brushed, I mean like just touched. And then it nicked the tail end of my motorbike. And then after that, it was just gas on, get out of there. Because like Dean says, where there's one, there's another not too far away. I wasn't staying around. (laughs) Smart move. This little big bean, like he was little, but he was big. The arms, when he put his arm up, it was long. Even though he was squatted, this thing never stood up. It kept its squatted pose. It just braced. He fought. I say he because it looked like a little boy. When I say little boy, the size, I got a male vibe off him. The arm, when he put it up, you could see it was longer than, say, a human arm would be. The neck, it was like his head was sitting on his shoulders, pretty much. The black fur, it could have been a dark brown, but at the time, I seen black. An estimate, maybe two and a half, three inches, not scruffy, not messy, pretty well groomed for himself. So mum or dad's looking after him. If there's one of these guys, there's always another. And knowing that he was small, what was in the bush on the left or the right to me? Exactly. The next morning, going down there, up to that corner, adrenaline's pumping. Is it going to happen again? Is it going to happen again? But, yeah, now coming down that hill, I'm very, very aware there's not another soul on this road. Can't stress that enough because no one's awake at that hour. I'm up at stupid o'clock. So the whole way down from my home at Binnaburra to when I got to the bottom of Witherin, coming onto the Rainbow Desert Road, there wasn't a single person coming up or down. It was just me. That's it. Still dark at that stage, right? There's a lot of trees overhanging on top of the road on each side. Very tall trees. There's no street lights there. This is country road. No street lights at all. Absolutely dark. You had your high beam on, I'm, I'm assuming? A little light bar on the front of my bike. The way I positioned it, it's not pointing straight because if I point it straight, it's going to be in the rear vision mirror of other people. So it's tilted down a bit. Very bright, very bright. You see in your headlight this little being in the middle of the road on all fours or squatting down but not using its arms for support? He was squatted real low. The arms weren't fully stretched. Picture a push-up, like a push-up. His hind legs, they were spread apart, bent. I'd never seen his feet, never seen his feet. It was like a squatted push-up in a sense, but he had his head down like he was looking at the ground. Like I seen the top of his head, but never his face. So he must have heard you coming and he must yeah. have seen the light coming. I don't know how this being messed up. Like my bike's loud. It is so loud. Honda CBR 600 with exhaust, so it's loud. You can hear this bike coming for quite some time. I assume it is a juvenile mistake because he would have heard me coming the lights. This is what me, Dean, have discussed. Maybe he's come down and landed or misjudged or mistimed. Wrong place, wrong time for him. Right place, right time for me. It's a bitumen road? Yes. The sides of the road going down onto that, is it a high embankment on either side or is it high on one side and low on the other? Coming down my left, it is high. It's a high, steep sort of ridge and then my right coming down, there's bush. And which direction was this little being's head? To your right or your left? Do you reckon it had come from the left embankment or come from the right embankment? He's probably come from the high side. 
he was in my riding line and his head was facing towards me. Whether he's stumbled off, landed, gone, crap, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, and then I'm going, oh no, oh no, oh no. I don't have the vibe that this little guy presented itself. I feel as though it's made a mistake. I really do. He was squatted facing me. You're saying squatting, but I'm just trying to picture that body position. So if it's a push-up, usually you've got your legs straight out behind you, right? And your arms are out and your elbows are out to the side. Yes. Like a push-up, but the legs were a little bit bent. His legs were bent. I wouldn't say like high. He was really low set. The left hand or the right hand that it put up towards you? Right hand because he put his left hand down on the ground like a support. So he's gone from the squatted, gone up a little bit, turned his head right back around like, oh, no, planted his left hand and then raised that right arm. So squatting first on two legs and then when he spots you, one hand goes down and and at the top of his body tips down into a push-up position and he lifts one hand up, as you said, as if to brace for impact, right? Yeah, and that's another thing. It shows intelligence. Brace for impact was getting ready to protect itself from me essentially hitting it. Considering how fast these beings can move, you'd think it would have tried to do more than just put its arm up. It would have tried to roll out of the way or jump or something. I'm wondering whether it was injured. When I felt the brush, it wasn't hard. It was just a brush. I wasn't hurt. Uh, I get the feeling he he wasn't hurt, but he would have just been really shocked. Both parties, I'm shocked. He's shocked. For sure. The head that you saw, what shape was that head? Definitely a bigger head to a human or, say, a five-year-old boy. It was definitely bigger, more rounded, but at the top, a slight ridgy bit, definitely bigger. Definitely what you hear, head and shoulders. Small for what they are or what it was, large for what a human would be. A lot larger if we're talking human terms. The hand that it put out in your direction with the palm facing you? Yes. Yeah, and you noticed the colour of the skin in that palm. Darker than ours, darker than ours, but not like a gorilla where it's just that solid black but it had that same lettery look and the pink pigmentation just like working hands like it's just been working all its life you know grabbing trees or you know sliding just well worked hands but i've seen pink pigmentation patchy all over its hands and four fingers and a thumb like a human's hands without question it's seared in my head that stood out keep saying to everyone that I talk to about, like, it's seared in my head. I'll never forget it. Four fingers and a thumb. Think of a male hand and maybe add an inch onto each finger. It was just a little bit bigger than a fully grown man's hand. And this is a little one, the juvenile. Imagine if you'd seen the parents. My bike would be on the side of the road and I'd be a missing person case. (laughs) Maybe. That was the same one as Glenn's encounter. I wouldn't be here talking to you. All to be there would be my bike. And how far away was it from where Glenn had his wither and the famous now, it's a pretty famous case now, but where he saw that enormous yowie in front of his truck. How far away was that? Glenn's is down the bottom. It's a corner before Sharp Park. He got it down the bottom. I got mine up the top. He got big, I got middle. Dean took me to that spot where Glenn had his sighting. I know that there's the Canungra Army Base on either side of that particular stretch of road. Is that the same up the top where you saw yours? On the right, that's Canungra Military Land. You described the arms as quite long in proportion to its body compared to a human and and quite muscular. What about the legs? Still kind of muscly. I only seen probably to the knee. And then down from that, um, it was in the dark. Well, wasn't lit up. So I never seen feet. From bum to knee, little kid that's hit the gym way too many times. Muscly, muscly, stocky. 
stocky muscly. Was the only movement that he made moving his palm up towards you? He didn't move his legs at all or move his body at all? It moved. It kept down. So it kept down and went right back and then left hand on the ground, arm up, palm up. It was like he got up from the push-up and pivot. He had seconds, I had seconds. So that was his move and my move was just to adjust my line. He kind of went from push-up, pivoted, grounded himself and then braced for impact by putting his arm up and then palm, and then they brushed my boot and then the back of my body. Brushed your boot? So you, you felt something You felt oh, something yeah. on your boot? Without doubt. I'm going to be keeping this right boot. <laughs> <laughs> you have to. That's a special boot now. We'll have to get it framed somehow and get a little plaque on it. We'll figure something out. We'll figure something out <laughs> special for that boot. Yeah. In that light, did it seem to be covered in the same amount of hair or was it a little bit thinner or sparser in some areas? It was a bit patchy maybe on its arm. I wouldn't say bald spots. It's a little bit patchy, but he was covered head to toe. Palm, palm had no hair. He was covered head to toe. Well groomed. He wasn't malnourished. He wasn't fat. He wasn't scruffy. This thing was well looked after where it's looking after itself or it has family that it's looking after him. Yeah, from what I've seen, he was well-groomed, good shape for what he was and covered head to, um, well, knee where I've seen him, black fur. That what I can describe is maybe two and a half, three inches long. He didn't look up at you? Do you think maybe he knew that the light was going to be too bright and it was going to blind him? The light's very bright and maybe that's why, from what we know and what we've heard, their eyesight's really sensitive and they can see very well. So something artificial and that bright and that white could be blinding for them. It's essentially a little light bar. They're really bright. Most animals, human beings included, would look up to work out what is that that's coming at me. That's the sound, the noise of the bike and the light. You would instinctively look up at what was approaching. So the fact that he didn't makes me think that maybe he'd done that before. Unless he's playing a sick game of chicken, there's a lot of what ifs here. You know, he he could have been playing with me for we know. He could have been maybe trying to run me off the road. I don't know. Being juvenile, he could have been clumsy, fell down the the high side and then landed and, oh, crap, human. So many what ifs. The morning, I'll never forget. And running into one of these is way better than any triple shot coffee, I can tell you that much. You come out with the team researching. And that's the thing. We've got to trust each team member with our lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I do. I trust everyone on that team, everyone. Trust them all with my wife. It's even more special for us, for us as a team, because I know you, I know the boys and I know you and I know you wouldn't bullshit. So I know that you saw what you saw. Adds even more weight to the whole situation, the fact that one of our team had a sighting like that. Really special moment. So how did you feel out last weekend after having that happen on Wednesday? How were you feeling out? researching with the boys on Saturday night? It was in the back of my mind. It's not something, an experience like this that happens to you, you think about it for one or two days and move on. This is something I think about every day now. I know it's only been literally just over a week, but I think about it all the time. And when we went up to um, Wapa Dam, which was quite an interesting... <laughs> yes. Yeah, we won't, we won't go into that, but we do know why. Well, I mean, we, Dean will edit this bit out, but... Yeah. The whole time we're up there, yeah, and we, we do our thing. We were kind of more split up that night. Everyone was separated. So I did find myself by myself at times. And then, you know, you're scanning with the thermal camera, doing what we do, and then you go, oh, hang on. Remember last week you ran into a yowie? Oh, I'm by myself. (laughs) (laughs) Gary, where are you? I'm 200 metres down. Okay, cool. Um, Dean, where are you? I'm back at base camp, and that's about (laughs) another 200 metres. Oh, okay. Buck, where are you? Yeah, I'm uh, uh, 300 metres this way. 
at the time when I was in that situation, I didn't have a torch. All I had was the thermal camera. So I'm sitting in the dark going, okay, I'll just stay here. I'll just stay here. The last time I went out, I ended up, I think Dean had wandered down the track a little bit and I couldn't hear him and it was pitch black and I just had this sudden feeling of crap. I suddenly felt quite nervous because I couldn't see him. As soon as I put the thermal up and scanned around, I could see him. He was right there, but you you can't see anything in the pitch black. So it's quite unnerving. And I can only imagine after your experience, a couple of days beforehand, then being out at night in the middle of the night in in the forest by yourself, I'm guessing that would add an extra element of nerves to the whole situation. Definitely. Going out and doing this with the amazing team, I remember the first time, first overnight everyone knows, was the legendary Springbrook Firm. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we'll talk about beginner's luck, mate. Obviously being friends with Gary prior to AYR and then eventually got in the circle. I came from Luke Moore and the Bunjalung tribe, shout out. So that, that was now teaching in high school. Always been fascinated, always believed get the invite to come out for an overnighter, get to meet Dean, which was an honor, still is, on dusk, setting up base camp. It was just a show from dark on. I think it was 11 o'clock-ish. That's when we all know Buck comes on the radio and goes, yeah, got something. And then, yeah, the rest of the night, just hearing these beings walk around, it was crazy. <laughs> I think Dean stayed up the whole night. I don't know how. He... <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. That was a fantastic night. That too, that night, that was just a rush. It was so addicting. It, it was, and and then to top it off, to see one, it's like getting hit by lightning twice. It's so rare. Shannon, has seeing this little being the other day, has that changed your idea of Yowies, your perception of Yowies? Is your feelings or your ideas any different from before that sighting to after? They're stronger. Absolutely stronger. It's like adding another layer of solid concrete as to these beings exist. And they do exist. I've seen it and no one can change my mind. And, you know, you'll have people that go, nah, nah. Well, guess what? You're crazy because your mind's shut and you're not open to it. I've seen it with my own eyes. These beings exist, whether you like it or not. There is no argument. I thought the thermals were as good as I personally was going to get. But to actually lay eyes on these beings, yaoi, they exist. You can't tell me otherwise. I wasn't expecting this. I wasn't thinking yaoi. I just just wasn't wasn't expecting this at all. I, it, it extremely caught off guard. It's just one of them cases. It's always when you're not looking for them that they will find you. To whoever's going to listen to this, what I've seen, it's real. They're very real. (laughs) They're real. If I wanted to read about something that was exciting to get my blood racing, it would be this. Was it tagging on with the parents and the parents went, come now, come now, and it just dawdled a bit? Or was it uh, by itself? You're not thinking about anything to do with yowies, anything to do with paranormal, anything to do with apart from I'm going to work. Cruising around the corner, it's the last thing you'd expect to see, especially that time of the morning, again, when you're, all you're thinking about is going to work. I think the situation itself uh, definitely caught this being off guard. The parents must have been around very close by. Uh, did it jump off the side into the base? Did it scramble back up into this private property? We don't know. We have checked around for uh, prints and any kind of sign or anything like that. Unfortunately, with the terrain and the area, uh, it's a little bit hard to find. It's just gone like that. Just, just a brush. You don't get much closer than that, do you? <laughs> no, well, not unless your name's Dean Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> Realisation of what has just happened to me is... <laughs> I got to work and I sat down for 20 minutes just composing myself. And um, yeah, at the time, definitely shock, definitely fear. What would you say to the people who said, well, hang on, you're a Yowie researcher, why wouldn't you have taken that opportunity to stop the bike and go back and try and get a photo? Well, 
like you, like you say, Dean Harrison, but there's <laughs> one, there's always another. And if he was little, there was someone bigger, someone a lot bigger. And I'm not, I wasn't going to stop and hang around and get that money shot. So you're saying basically his experience that stopped you from going yes. back. <laughs> yes, otherwise my bike would be standing here and I wouldn't. <laughs> As I say, this could happen to anyone, anywhere at any time. It happens to everyday people. Truck drivers, doctors, lawyers, police, parks and wildlife, military, even Yowie researchers aren't exempt. After we shot this footage with Shannon, we ascended down into the valley in the rainforest in search of signs and prints. The terrain was very livable, suspiciously flat and trodden with very little lantana for the most part. Gary and Buck found two prints, one measuring around 15 inches and another far smaller. Perhaps this was Shannon's little friend. I ventured a couple of hundred metres further downstream while still on the rainforest embankment. The floor of the rainforest was flat and compacted. There were large trees with thick vines that could easily be used for a ladder and more than enough room up the trees to sit or sleep. Some of it had a mid canopy, perfect for privacy from below. While in a moment of silence, a crashing came from behind. My mind's analysis and justification was just one of our crew. Whatever it was, sounded as though it was on two legs. It took hands to break down the foliage and branches to clear the path. And then silence. Dakota has a vast amount of terrain protected from the public. The perfect habitat to live relatively undisturbed. And vast enough to keep out of reach. Even from the military. To read more about Yowie sightings in Queensland, go to yowiehunters.com, sightings in Queensland. To hear Rob tell more about his sighting, go to our homepage, witness audio reports in report number 104. For Glenn's report, go to report number 129. Thanks for listening. <laughs>